California. I'll be it's a small world. It is. Well, if we're not expecting anybody else, um, then we can go. We sure can. Oh, great. I don't know who's on here, really. One of the said want to make sure everybody sees our uh, St. Columba updates and, and needs. If y'all y'all should have gotten a copy of that in your bulletin last uh, last week, and uh, that's the collection for St. Columba for Thanksgiving. So everybody remember that we've got that going on. Want to make sure that got a good plug today. Thank you. It's surely needed, that's for sure. Okay, if we're ready, um, then let's have a prayer. Gracious God, we ask that you would open up our minds um, to these wonderful words in your word. Um, help us to fully comprehend your message to us because this is indeed a powerful message of your grace what you have done for us um, and what our appropriate uh, response to that should be as your believers as we profess to be your believers so we ask that you will open our minds and our hearts to this message so that when we lead each other this morning we will be better ambassadors of um of the gospel we ask this all in jesus name amen, amen. All right, so I'll, I'll read it. So we're all in this. This is from the New International Version, so they're all the same place. Let's see if I can read it with feeling. Excuse me. I, I, Ted just called. Okay. Go ahead. I is am. Is everybody, um, you're going to mute everybody, Jerry? Oh, He's going. Yes. Okay. So that's okay. I just looked up. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and go. Um, this is Paul writing to, of course, the church. Galatia, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then, that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse as, is it, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is those who is who is hung. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to the human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to his seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, 
meaning what was Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Now we're going to, it's going to take a little bit to unpack it. So <laughs> it took me a little while to unpack it. So, <laughs> so I'm going to try, you know, it sounds like it contradicts itself throughout there. It, it does if you on the first read. Okay. So since we're not been watching Galatians, we're, let's get ourselves caught up again. Um, Remember, these believers are not Jews. They are not formally Jews. They are predominantly, if, if not totally, there are some Jews present, but Gentiles. So, so they don't have any background um, in God, in the God of Israel. Um, they, they don't really don't know him. And, they're, and, and insofar as their belief up until now, they are immature, very immature. Uh, so Paul taught them the, the gospel the salvation, the message of salvation in Jesus, the Son of God. He taught them that they are saved by their faith through the grace of God. He, um, he did not teach them that the law was the means of salvation. The law is the old covenant. He taught them more or less the new covenant. That is the, um, the law, the principle of grace, God's grace. Um, about faith and God's grace. And he warned them about false teachers and he was kind of upset about that. And he warned them about anybody teaching them anything different than that. Um, he tells them, I don't have any reason to mislead you. You know, I got everything I know straight from Jesus Christ. So he's kind of presenting to them his credentials and that their salvation is on faith alone. And the law cannot justify you before God. So um, in my Bible, this part of, of Paul's letter is called faith or observance of the law. That's what the, um, the student, um, my student Bible calls it. Once again, Paul is astonished and surprised at how quickly these false teachers have introduced doubt into this new church. And he's shocked that his readers, I mean, that, it's, that, his, that the believers that he left there or even considering law over grace, or thinking that it's a combination of both. So once again, he's he's <laughs> he's, uh, he's he's pretty mad. Um, you know, you foolish. I mean, nobody likes to be called foolish, but he's you. He's calling them foolish, and in this sense, um, the meaning of the word means um, acting unwisely or um, incompetent. They're not ignorant. They're not ignorant. They know better because he told them the truth. And now he's act, they're acting as if they really never heard him. So he makes this offhand comment, they must be bewitched. There must be something that's taken over them under some spell. Because now you're rejecting everything that I taught you, that gospel message. That of Jesus' death and resurrection. And, you, and are back on the law. And it's it's frustrating to him. Um, 
because from his standpoint, clearly immersed in all that Judaism was, I mean, he was a Pharisee, he's frustrated that they are rejecting the freedom that Christ has, has given to them and are falling back on the law. Now, we know we've talked about the fact that these false teachers are mainly um, what were called Judaizers. Um, some commentators you look at will call them agitators, filling them up with all this malarkey about the law, the law, the law. So Paul says, just wait a second. Let me just ask you this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing of the faith? And he said, you should know that the Holy earned by keeping the law. Um, in fact, um, he says, we, we receive the Holy Spirit through our faith, through the grace of God. And that's the only way you receive it. And you could almost hear him yelling. I mean, if this were in this day and age, it would be an email in all caps. I mean, he's really upset. And because he, he's fearful that they will that they will regress and fall back on adherence to uh, to obeying a law rather than on God's grace through their through their faith in in him so um this part of the letter and really maybe all of galatians if you want to think of it this way is about what happened when jesus came to earth and died for us and was raised by his father which introduces us to the new covenant of grace so you've got a principle of law and a principle of a grace at work here <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> And one commentator that, that I have here in my little pile of books on Galatians is, he, he said, think of it this way, and I'm going to quote him. Under law, we are blessed and we grow spiritually by earning and deserving. That's under the law, by earning and de deserving. Under grace, we are blessed and grow spiritually by believing and receiving. Now, can you feel the difference between earning and deserving and believing and receiving? And in fact, he says, God deals with you under the covenant of grace. So we shouldn't be responding to him under the principle of law. So the problem is that some of the Jewish Christians that are present are really have a foot in the law. They've still got a foot in the law. And it's a little bit understandable. Um, and they, so they're pushing it. And Paul is trying to say to them, all the wonderful things that have happened to you, all of the experiences that you've had are from the spirit that was bespo bestowed upon you when you believed, was bestowed upon you when you professed your faith in Jesus Christ. So don't let all that go down. Don't let don't let them uh, don't be in, in vain and act in vain as you go down this law of this rabbit hole of the law. Don't go down there. God supplied the spirit. Miracles are brought about by faith, not by the law. And so, you know, in, in general, all the talk about Abraham. So we're now we're going to talk about all the, the mentions or uh, references to Abraham because. In the. Uh, let me see if I can say this without trying to sound like I'm condemning anyone because I am not. The, the Jews are really wrapped up in Abraham and the covenant God made with Abraham that his descendants, his descendants are what um, are, are the people of God. I might say that's still alive and well. However, Abraham is revered in not only Judaism, but also in um, Islam and in Christianity. So Abraham is a is a huge prophet across the three major religions. But Jew, Jewish people tend to go back to, are you in the line of Abraham? I mean, that's kind of the way they, they see the world. Um, and it's foundational. That covenant that God made with Abraham is foundational. Yes, it is. Christianity doesn't deny that. Not at, not at all. Not at all. Um, so they'll start talking about that. You know, what about Abraham? What about Abraham? Well, Paul says, well, what about Abraham? Okay, what about him? Let's talk about him. You know, let's talk about who 
Abraham is, was, and still is in Christianity. He says, hey, Abraham heard God, believed God, trusted God, and acted on what God told him to do. That's that's Abraham's story. Now, you know, I know this is going to sound like I'm parsing words, but if you read a lot of commentaries, you, you, you need to notice one thing. It doesn't say that Abraham believed in God. It said Abraham believed God, trusted God, acted on what God said, heard God. And so the Jews are trying to, to, to um, put forth this argument um, <clears throat> about works, works, works. And Paul argues, hey, wait a minute. Abraham was justified by God because of his faith alone, believed God, believed God, trusted God, not by his faith plus any works. Abraham received the grace of God way back in Genesis in the covenant that was made with Abraham. And Paul argues that Abraham believed God and acted on his faith and trust in God. And so God accounted him as righteous and therefore Abraham, Abraham had standing before God. Um, Martin Luther, um, I, I read this quote too, said that um, faith says to God, faith says to God, I believe what you say. Faith says, I believe what you say. So Paul tells these Gentile Christians, hey, wait a minute. You're children of Abraham. See, that wasn't the issue. You know, are you in or are you out? It's so human. <laughs> it's so human. Are you in or are you out? He says, not only, he says, know that not, not only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham, that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Now, that's an interesting way um, and a very important way to describe being in a descendant, so to speak, of Abraham. Only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. That's why Abraham is called the father of faith. Abraham was made righteous strictly by his faith. He, had, he didn't do a doggone thing when God justified him. He hadn't left town. He hadn't done anything that God had asked him to do at that point when God justified him. It was merely based on the fact that he believed God. So everybody who believes in God is accounted righteous. It's not a solely Hebrew or Jewish thing. So Paul is basically rebuking his, his Jewish Christians who are trying to drag the Gentile Christians under the law. They did sort of believe they were superior because they were literally descended from Abraham and observe the law. And, and so again, Paul is saying, not so fast. The link, the qualifying factor to be a descendant of Abraham is not genetics and it's not works. It's faith, which is a, is a big difference. I mean, they were really tied up. I mean, you know, the Old Testament is full of genealogy. You see it. It's full of genealogy. Who are you? Who are you related to? Who, are, who you know, who, it's a big deal to a lot of people. But Paul is saying, no, you don't get it. That's not what happened back then. It's not about your genetics and it's not about your works. It's about faith, the faith of Abraham. And he knows that that's going to be shocking. It's going to be shocking to former Jews. And, um, and, and, and let me stop here and say this. Um, I also read this in several commentaries. We are not to read these words of Paul. We are not to read this idea about, um, about the genetic thing. It's, it's about faith as an argument that Paul is making to say that God is abandoning the Jews. Nothing could be further from the truth. That's not what is happening here. He's not abandoning the Jews. Um, he is not finish with them. Uh, so don't interpret any of this as that. And that's sometimes you may have heard of uh, this term replacement theology, where the Gentiles, the church replaced Israel. You may have heard that term. That's not what is happening here. 
That is not true because we know that's not true in other scriptures in the Bible and other places in the Bible. God is not finished with his, his original chosen people. This is just the point that Paul is trying to make about evolving and what really was going on with Abraham and that comment about his seed, his seed as in singular. So Paul is saying all who put their faith in Jesus Christ are sons of Abraham. Let's just clear all, all this up. Abraham has spiritual and genetic sons, if you want to look at it that way. God has a plan and a place for both. And, and and maybe I mean I'm not one is not necessarily more important than the other, but certainly there are far more spiritual sons of Abraham at this point in Christianity than there are um, genetic. Uh, but the point is, God has a plan for both the spiritual and genetic sons of Abraham. And then Paul goes on, um, and 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 we're going to unpack this because it's too good not to it's too good not to talk about it. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. Paul is arguing here that there are two kinds of people. Those that live by faith, like Abraham, and those that live by observing the law. To have the faith of Abraham, to live by faith, brings blessings. But those that are strictly living by the law are under a curse. Um, because if we say that we can live by the law and be saved by the law, we're saying that we can comply with all the laws 24-7. That's what it would take for God to bless us and uh, in, and bless us with uh, his uh, redemptive salvation. And that is never going to happen. That is never going to happen. We're never going to be able to obey the law totally, wholly, 24-7. It can't be done, so we're cursed if we try to do that. Your lives are going to be miserable. They're going to be stressful. All you're going to be doing is trying to be perfect and obey every single law. And we can't do it. But we can escape the curse and enjoy God's blessing because of Christ. Because of Christ. He redeemed, paid the price, if you like, paid the price better than redeemed. Um, for us, he bought us um, because. Because he became the curse. He became a curse for us. So because of Jesus coming, he took on the curse. And you might be wondering about the part of the scripture that goes on to talk about hanging on a tree. That was really a lot of good research. That was kind of fun. That takes you back to um, Deuteronomy, where it says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Gosh, who knew, right? Um, it turns out if someone was guilty of a capital offense, they were put to death the, back in the times, um, and their body was exposed on a pole. And you, and of course, we you know how how what how strict Judaism was about bodies and um, and how quickly they bury bodies and and the respect that should be given to to a corpse. So. Um, so, and you must not leave this body hanging on the pole overnight. You need to bury it the same day because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. You can't desecrate the land of the Lord by leaving this body out on a pole. So take it now to over time, the pole was thought of as a tree. And in the New Testament time of Jesus, the cross was thought of as a tree and the passage isn't about crucifixion per se but about jesus hanging on a pole or a tree there was nothing worse in ancient israel than to be put to death and your corpse 
left open exposed the shame and the humiliation and all of the scavenging that would be going on by birds and animals. Um, and the hanging reference is not about strangulation, but about having a corpse mounted on a pole after death. Even if the death occurs, the body shouldn't be left overnight because the shame would be excessive. So that's a lot of what is going on here and what Paul is trying to say. Jesus received the curse. He was mounted on a pole for us who deserve to be mounted on the pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing that sh that um, that the blessing that was given to Abraham might be given to the Gentiles through Christ, so that by faith we receive the promise um, of the Holy Spirit. So that's uh, that's a little bit about where Paul was going with some of that talk that just kind of takes you down a little bit of a rabbit hole. Sh if you take it up a notch, just keep in mind that he's trying to argue argue with them um, that there was the law and Jesus came and satisfied that. We couldn't do it. That he satisfied all of the law for us because we couldn't do it. So while we were under trying to live by the law, we were basically cursed. We were never going to make it. It was never going to happen. Until... Christ sends until God sends his son and he takes it all on for us so that we are able to receive the blessings of Abraham. Um, as, as it goes on, um, as Paul goes on and making this argument for salvation um, by grace or, or faith alone, the natural question that should be forming up in your mind is does that mean I don't have to follow any of those laws of God? Any of them? If I'm a believer and I have faith, do I have to follow any of the laws of God? It's a natural question that you might might ask. If Jesus saved us, why should I try this? Why should I strive to live a holy life? Okay, so in answer to that, Paul says, "Hey, look." The promise, the promise came to Abraham first, and he was accounted as righteous and justified by his faith. 430 years later, God gives the law to Moses. The law doesn't overturn or annul the promise that God gave to Abraham, nor no more than anything that happens, let's take an example, no more than anything that happens after um, after a will is made can overturn what the dying person wanted. It is what it is. You can't overturn it. So the law is not overturning the promise that was made to Abraham. And a law cannot change what God had done in his promise to Abraham. So Paul is arguing the difference between the promise to Abraham and the law. Because he could, and you ask yourself, oh my gosh, this is beginning to hurt my head. But he's got a lot of people on the ground there that just keep talking about Abraham and keep talking about things that is completely destroying all the work that Paul's done. So he's kind of going right at it. He's beating it into, into the ground. Um, so he said, if you're giving something because of a promise, think about what I'm getting ready to say. If you're giving something because of a promise, it, it has nothing to do with your performance. If you are given something because of a law, it has nothing to do with a promise. It can't be both ways, in other words. You either are saved by grace or works or the other. And Paul says, it's by grace that you're saved. Think of it this way. All right, let me try it this way. For a promise to bring a result. If someone promises you something, for it to bring a result, you have to believe. You have to believe in the promise. For a law to bring you a result, you have to obey it. You have to obey it. For a promise, you have to believe it. And for a law, you have to obey it. So if I tell you, to come, come on over to my house and I'll give you a million bucks. Okay? 
The only way you do not get the million is if you don't believe me and come to my house. If I promise I'll give you a million bucks if you come to my house and you believe me and you come, you get a million. The only way you don't get it is if you don't believe me and you don't come. If I tell you to come to my house and I'll give you a million bucks, but you have to live in my pool house and you have to keep my pool clean and you have to keep my house clean. You have to keep my lawn mowed and, and care for my pets and, and, and care for me as I grow old. Then you have to do all of those things before you get the million bucks. You have to do all of those things, all of those things. The promise that God made was to Abraham and his seeds singular. And the seed was Jesus. We just read that. The law given 430 years later doesn't set aside anything that God said and promised to Abraham. God gave it all to Abraham in a promise, not in a law, in a promise. And he gave it to all of us through the seed, Jesus. So what do we have to do to receive it? Believe it. Believe. Believe the promise. Once again, I, I guess, you know, Paul's beating, beating it into the ground, but he's making sure that these new Christians or any new Christian, because this can happen, doesn't get tripped up. Your salvation is based on faith, on your faith through God's grace. And it began with the promise to Abraham. We're all going to go back to Abraham. That's fine. Abraham is indeed the father of faith. Goes back to Abraham and then his seed, which was Jesus. It is still true today. You know, it's some. Uh, sometimes it's tempting for more mature Christians or those who've been believers for a really long time to start um, to start to think that their status with God or that their place, um, their place with God. Or their, um, or even their salvation, is kind of based on their works. It's sometimes you know people get get over there. It's based on their work, based on their human effort, based on their performance, and it's never the case. It's not the case. Paul is dragging these new Christians in these churches in Galatia away from these false teachers who are over there in the works arena and dragging them back to the cross what happened on the cross god's promise precedes the law and we are to rely on god's promise okay so if that's the case then the next question that we all want answered is what was the purpose of the law in the first place what why did we have the law in the first place well glad you asked paul says the purpose of the law was not about salvation it was about sin. It wasn't about salvation. It was about sin. To show you, to show you that you are a despicable, chronic sinner. Isn't that lovely? It was to show you that you're a sinner. To show that us that we have a problem. That we are lawbreakers, too. On top of everything else, we're sinners and lawbreakers breakers and to help us discover that, that we can that we cannot be the solution to our own sinfulness we cannot be the solution to our own sinfulness because we can't keep the law 24 7 so the law was instituted to help us understand our condition as sinners and you know and and i think there is a little bit of paul's former life coming in here because remember he was pretty smug he was pretty arrogant he was pretty self-satisfied pharisee he knew the law he was an interpreter of the law until the moment when the law made him see and feel that he too was a prisoner of sin. When, 
when Jesus appeared to him, he too realized he was a prisoner of sin, unable to set himself free, which is what the purpose of the law was, for us to understand that we're prisoners and we can't set ourselves free. It shows us that we do not just fall short of God's will, requiring us to do some extra work, to do better, to try harder, but that we are completely under the power of sin and we need to be rescued. We can't just go out and do a few more good deeds, you know, just, just pray harder. We have to acknowledge that we are a sinner and that we are unable to save ourselves through anything we might do and we need help. We need to be rescued. It's to show us that we need to be saved, a savior. The law shows us we're not righteous and it can't give us the power to be righteous. So in some ways, the law is our tutor. <laughs> you hear him talk about the guardian and the tutor. So, so in some ways, the law is our tutor. Before faith came, we were all lock, locked up. We we're all locked up by, um, by sin and by the law. And so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, to lead us to Christ. So it could be justified by faith. And now that faith has come along, we're no longer under the supervision or the guardianship or the tutelage of the law. Okay, so now to the final question you should be asking. Okay. I know why the law was put there. Do we have to obey it? Now, th none of the laws were bad. I mean, none of the laws told you to go out and do something bad. In fact, just the opposite. Just take the Ten Commandments. There's nothing in the Ten Commandments that you likely want to go do. And now, shoot, I can't do it because there's a law. I mean, of course there's a law against the things that are in there. And some of them are to have to do with relationships, which, which if you can adhere to them, you can have healthy and better relationships with each other, with your family. I mean, think about it. So there was nothing in the law that if you followed it and could, would take you to a bad place. Nothing about it. So, okay. If we're not under the supervision, do we have to obey it? Well, Let's talk about the analogy of our parents and children. The law is like um, the law is like a parent rearing a child until it grows up, and um, and you say, okay, now that it's grown up and mature, does that, that does that mean all the efforts that I put into that child to rear the child and teach the child how to live? Um, is going to be tossed off. Is it going to be tossed away? Well, the parents, the parents would say, I hope not. The parents would say, I hope the values that I taught my children will influence the way they live their lives. Um, and living a good life and living a lawful life, if you will, not in fear or in any kind of forced compliance situation. Um, but just because they want to live a good life, that's all great. That's all great. I mean, hey, obey as many of those laws as you possibly can. You're not going to be, you're not going to go wrong. Not at all. Paul is saying to us that after faith, we don't look at the law as the way to salvation. We don't look at the law as the way to salvation. We know what God's promise was. God's grace. We know all about that God's grace um, and our faith are the way to salvation, but obeying God's laws, obeying those um, commands to respect and not covet and not murder and not be envious and, and on and on and on are a grateful response because we know what God wants. It's all throughout the Bible. If we, if we try to, if we still continue to try to obey what God has asked, it is a, it is a grateful response to the salva salvation that he's given us merely through his grace and our faith. 
So we obey as many of those laws as we possibly can as a response to his love, to his grace and gratitude for that promise he made to Abraham and that he is not holding us, holding our salvation at bay until we obey every one of those laws 24 seven, because we can't do it. We can't do it. So when Christians understand that their salvation is, comes by grace through faith, then we're not going to obey God any longer for our sake, for what's in it for us. We obey God's commandments for his sake, to please him, not to get something from him, but to please him because he's already freely given us salvation just, just as we believe. If we believe God and believe that Jesus is his son, then his grace gives us salvation. So we obey as many of those laws as we can for his sake, as a response to what he's done for us. So in some ways, law and grace work together. Law is not the means to salvation, but it's a response. Obeying them is a response to God's grace. You know, unless, unless at some point, if we know, unless at some point, we're sinners. Now, kind of think about this. Step back. If if we don't understand we're sinners, if we don't understand that we're lawbreakers, unless we know how big a debt each one of us is racked up for all of our sinful lawbreaking behavior, then we will never, never have any idea about how great the sacrifice was that Christ made for us. If we don't really get it, if we don't really get our sinfulness and what we were unable to achieve by ourselves that we really don't know. We really, you know, we really don't know how great a sacrifice Christ made for us. So think about this. If we have moments and we all do, okay, we all do. If we have moments where we think I'm not all that bad, I'm not a murderer, you know, I'm not a kidnapper. I'm not a rapist. I'm not an abuser. I'm not, you know, you name, you go down the list of heinous crimes. You know, if you start going down the road, I'm not all that bad. Then the idea of grace will never change your life. It'll be a ho hum. You won't get, if you don't get, if you don't get how big your debt we racked up and how great the sacrifice was that Christ made for us so that we could live rather than die. Grace isn't going to change your life at all. It's going to be a ho hum. It's going to be a word. Just a word with no real meaning to it. The law showed us that we really are sinners, prisoners of sin. The law points us to Christ as he really is, which are, is our savior and our rescuer. The one who did obey the law on our behalf and then died in our place so we could receive the promised blessing. So I want to end with a commentator that I did find Um I don't know, many of you might know, this This guy just passed away, Timothy Keller, great Presbyterian minister in New York. His last church was in New York City. Um, I, just wanted, um, I just wanted to read it from a book that he wrote on Galatians because it's really, really good. I need my better glasses for this, not my computer glasses. And, and, and Timothy Keller is actually quoting a, um, a commentator named John Stott. After God gave the promise to Abraham, he gave the law to Moses. Why? He had to make things worse before he could make them better. The law exposed sin, provoked sin, condemned sin. The purpose of the law was to lift the lid off man's respectability and disclose what he is really underneath sinful rebellious guilty under the judgment of god and helpless to save himself and the law must still be followed to do its god-given duty today one of the great faults of the contemporary church is the tendency to soft pedal sin and judgment we must never bypass the law and come straight to the gospel 
To do so is to contradict the plan of God in biblical history. No man has ever appreciated the gospel until the law has first revealed him to himself. It is only against the inky blackness of the night sky that the stars begin to appear. And it is only against the dark background of sin and judgment that the gospel shines forth. I really, I really liked that. So I just wanted to share that with y'all. So you can unmute everybody. And after they come up for air <laughs> and all these ladies that the entire time as a teacher, I watched you opening books and looking at books and hmm. So, okay. <laughs> were you listening or were you researching what you were going to say to me, which is usually what teach what people say is, Hey, the whole time someone's talking to you, you're just trying to figure out what you're going to say when they're finished. So let's hear it. <laughs> Let's hear it. Nobody? Come on, man. <laughs> Come on. I didn't say that to scare you away, but <laughs> but you sure had a lot of books open, so what did they say? <laughs> okay. Or did they say something different than I said? Or did they do they help you with what you have in front of you? Go ahead, Jeff. I interrupted you. No, it's okay. You sure gave us a lot to think about. <laughs> that is deep. Um, but one of the questions that comes to mind that I'm not sure Paul answers here. Okay. But he raises this whole discussion, raises the question. Okay, well, if, if faith is the answer, how do we come by faith? And and that's kind of a tricky, when we try to answer that, it's very easy to flip right back into the works. You, uh, uh, it was a garbled, that last part of your statement we couldn't hear. Okay, I'm, I'm saying that the question comes up is, if faith is the answer, how do we come to faith? And so I think the tricky part of that is in trying to answer that, we also fall right back into the trap of works, that that it has something to do with what we accomplish, that we accomplish the our own faith. Now, there's a deep theological question there about where, how do we come to faith? But I think it, it's worth thinking about. It is. It is. Well, how do you come to believe in something else besides? Just say, how do you come to believe in anything? Right. You know, um, is this some kind of proof? I mean, you know, is you know, how do you come to have how do you come to have faith in God? How did Abraham come to have faith in God? I, I don't think there's any proof. I mean, that's kind of what makes it faith. <laughs> right, right. And um you know, and again, what I'm what I I think it's important to think about the fact that right at that point, when we try to answer that, we fall right back into the human way of thinking about what was it you said, earnings and deserving? Yeah. That mm -hmm. we the law accomplish that. Earth. That we kind of yeah, I'm I'm letting myself believe that. But I think it goes deeper than that. I think we have to appreciate the fact that and, and there's a theological point here that maybe maybe it truly is a gift of God that we don't it's that faith is imparted on us without anything we have to do with it. Which is contrary to everything else in our life. Right, exactly. Contrary right. to everything. Right. Everything. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, it's transactional. Your life is pretty much transactional. So yes. I'm, I'm with you. I'm going, down the, I'm going down that road with you. And I sometimes I think it's just one of those, it's that leap you have to take at some point that, okay. But we have Do to I accept it. Something? Yeah, go ahead. Betty. But just that we have to accept that gift. Well, doesn't that doesn't that mean that we Goes are back saying to that faith? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's very tricky. I hear you, and I I'm not arguing with you. But but all of a sudden, doesn't that make it something that we've done to accomplish that? 
Well, the we done, I think you could argue back again, would be have faith. That you are doing something when you have faith. You know, in that in a sense, you are doing something. Right. I think it all boils down to if you don't believe there's anything bigger than you are, you're probably never going to get there. Is that free will? Well, well, free will is all the dumb stuff we do all the time because we because we have the we can make our own decisions and we make them and we do have free will. We don't have to believe. We don't have to believe. Uh, you know, it's not. It's. I mean, if if God wanted that way, a lot of things wouldn't have happened. You know, um, but we have a choice to make. Do we believe or not? You know, I always go back to the thief on the cross who did nothing up to that top, that time when he asked Christ if he could be with him today in paradise, and Christ, you know, said, "Yes, you will be." He did nothing. He wasn't baptized. He, you know. Yeah. Well, if you're making the point that all you have to do is believe, that you're making that point. He did believe Christ was a, Jesus was the Son of God. He believed yes. that at that moment. I mean, he didn't put it that way exactly, but you know, he knew there was something going on here that was bigger than everybody, and that, and he knew he was guilt guiltless. And and the rest of them deserved what they were getting, and he didn't deserve what what he was getting. Um, but I mean, it does make the point that all you have to do is believe, which is the point. Yes, right. Which is the point. <laughs> I mean, so, well, to, to 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 Betty's other point is, boy, there's a lot of people that feel like you have to be baptized, confirmed, be a you know a lot of other things. I, well. That uh, that moment says that's not true. You know that's not true. And you're not going to get uh -huh. rejected because you don't have your church card with you or any of that. Um, are, are the other things all good? Th sure, they're all good things. They all show commitment and and are a response to what God has done. Um, but that's the you know that's the deathbed conversions that some people don't believe in. By the way. <laughs> You know, I so heard, people don't think that's fair. You know, fair, literally, they don't think that's fair. Look what I did all my life. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? What did you do besides believe? It's, it, it, you, know. you know, I keep hearing somebody like somebody's trying to say something. You know, and I it kind of sounds like Ted's voice. And I wish I had told him about just being able to call in. So I don't know whether that's him or not. I don't hear anything. Oh, we don't want to tell you you're hearing voices, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know. Don't... <laughs> you're not on. <laughs> Does anybody else hear anything? No. Okay. Oh. And I don't see anybody extra on the. I yeah, I don't either. Did you leave the phone on by any chance around you? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You could have left your phone on, come to think of it. Yeah. I guess I could have. You could have left your phone on. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, a million doctors probably were coming in, so. Yes. That's what happened. And, uh, he last said he was getting attached to stuff. Oh, they're doing some tests. Okay. Some more tests. Well, I mean, these, these, these are the hard questions, Jeff. <laughs> They are, and I don't know that we have answers to them, but it, it, I think there's a benefit in contemplating it. Oh, no, no, no. There, absolutely. No, a absolutely. As long as we don't get discouraged. Right, right. So we can't come up with a definitive answer, you know. Or, well, and or I when, think that's, like, when did you know, question? When did you know you had faith? I, I don't know. And, and I, I think hidden, hidden in that might be part of the answer, that it's a gift, that it's, it's God's revelation to us. And and you know we don't have to um, understand Do anything. more than that. Maybe his you gift. Know why we sometimes worry about it is because if we ever are talking to someone who doesn't believe, yeah, you know how do we? It's how do you just how do you describe it? What do you? I mean, what do you? What do you say? I I think about that a lot because uh, that would be a question. They would have those questions. Right. They would have those questions. And and as as good, you know, ambassadors of Christ, we would want to have an answer. 
Yeah. Um, and we all come in our own unique way to, yeah. you know, to the moment or to our faith over time. We all come in our own unique way, which is the way it's, the way it should be. But we would love to have a couple of really crisp, you know, 30 seconds or less answers, you know, to, to some questions so that others, so that, uh, you know, others would, you know, come to know him and have the, and the peace and the whatnot. And because we want that. Right. So they're, they're all, they're all good. But maybe that was just his gift to us on the tree. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, there's nowhere in there. In fact, there's probably somewhere in there, and there is, that we're never going to understand everything, you know? Right. Yeah, there is. There, there, we're never going to, we're just never going to, at least not here, going to understand um, everything. Um, but, hey there's the other side so exactly there's all kinds of revelation in the uh you know on on the, on the other side um so if you can accept some ambiguity or some unanswered you know questions um, and and, you, and we, that's part of our faith and not walk away because you can't answer every single solitary question i have then well, I always, I always think about the the discourse Job and God had when when I contemplate that question, you know. And I mean, for a very simplistic um, paraphrase, you know, God says, "Who are you to question me? I'm God. I can do whatever I want." <laughs> you know, believe it. That's. Um, right. I don't think we have to have all the answers, you know. Um, God is God, and and whatever He's doing in all His mysterious ways. Who am I to try to understand it? Right. Me too. Right. Right. But that's hard because we we want to understand and we have a little bit of arrogance there. We think we can probably understand things, you know? Well, in some ways, if we do figure it out, I mean, I, let me see if I can say this in a nice way. If we do figure it out, that really brings God down a lot of notches. Right, right, sure. <laughs> Well, I think that's a good limitation. Yeah. Maybe I want God to be all that great and powerful and wonderful <laughs> for me, you know, <laughs> for my own selfish purposes to help me get sure. there, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Like, you all are such a great group. You really are. I really, uh, I love it. I'm glad you could be with us, Betty. I am um, too. Okay. And uh, I hope you pick up Ted later on today. Yeah. And get him. I, he was ready to go yesterday. He sure sounded it. <laughs> he said to me, did Did you ask uh, Sid if she read that Psalm 122? I told him I did. Oh. I did. I didn't. Okay. I wasn't near a Bible when I picked up my telephone. I was downstairs. But I was writing down on a, on my grocery list paper. The Psalms he was telling me <laughs> to go look at. Um, and sure enough, you know, sure enough, it's a terrible thing. We need it, boy. We need to. We need to pray for that to settle down because that's horrible. That's horrible. Yeah, I can't even. I can't listen anymore. And I, I gotta admit, I'm, I'm an avid, um, you know, cable news. Yeah. Listener. I, I I can't. Well, it's not ours. It's not our. It's when they interview people that were actually there. When they families, when they when they tell you the things that they now know or have seen, it's disturbing. Or the or when as they walked through some of the some of these little um, what do they call them kibbutzes or whatever those little villages that were right along the border, what they found when they opened the doors kibbutz. It's disgust. It's literally it's worse than anything. You thought people could do. Yeah. You really, it's worse. You just, scary. Scary. All out of hatred. People they don't even know. How do you hate people you don't even know? I mean, how do you, and how do you have that kind of hate about it, anything for that matter? But to just literally on purpose, just open doors, no matter who was on the other side and just slaughter them. Oh my gosh. It's just, yeah. I mean, that's just going to be a long, as they continue down there, it's just going to long, ugly, horrible, horrible. And um, 
I, you know, I might even say it's a little biblical, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um, yeah, you have to really work. rough stuff in the Old Testament. Right. Some really rough stuff. Um, so it's a little bit of those proportions. And, and does that Psalm 122 says that Israel will not be destroyed? I don't know that 122 said it was another one, I think. Um, oh, was it? It was a series of them. It's a series of psalms that, that Ted was pointing to me. And he even had a name for him. Something and I mean and it was Israel was in the name of how they're grouped up. I haven't I haven't had a chance to do that research yet. Um but it, it, it is about it is about God and Israel, um, and his relationship, you know, with, with Israel. So um anyhow, I hope I hope you get him home today. I, I do too. I sure do. I mean, I'm glad he's not feeling bad, but I, who the heck wants to stay in a hospital? Yeah. Is he still in ICU or did they move him? They moved him yesterday. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, anybody else have anything else? Yeah. I will tell you, Beth got some good news at her oncologist. Oh, um, really? Oh. Great. Yes, yes. She went yesterday. Excuse me. She went Monday, and yesterday evening, she sent um, she sent out an email to some some of us that um, the doctor um, liked what he saw, you know, in the results that things had um, just okay. shrinking, um, and they were going to continue to follow her, some follow some places. I mean, you know, they never say you know what cure or, but. Um, things had really gone down and he liked, he liked what he saw at this point. So she's feeling much, much better. He told Good. her she better gain some weight before she is so thin. If y'all, oh my gosh, she is so thin. It's unbelievable. Mm. Um, doctor said you need to eat some food and gain some weight. So, um, so hopefully she'll be able to keep it down, you know, as now that she's not taking any radiation or chemo. Um, so she signed off saying she was going to go eat a banana split. So that, I mean, I got to tell you, she's kept a good spirits. Truly, she has. Yeah. Really kept decent spirits through the whole thing, even though it's been pretty ugly. Um, but so she was worried about the PET scan. So now she's passed out. And she, and she said to her church friends, she said, I'll be back as soon as I get a little strength. So. All right. Um, no one has any other commentary, then I'll close this with prayer. Holy God, as we've immersed ourselves in your word, we ask that you help us get what we all need um, in, in each our way so that we are able to do your will in our lives, what it is that you want us to do, so that we ask that you continue to open our minds to your word so that we could um, better understand what your plan is. We ask that you um, lift up all of those on our prayer list, of the friends and the, and the congregational members and the families. They are on that list. You know better than we do why they are there and what they exactly need. And, and, um, and we know that you will show them your peace and your hope and your comfort and your love love. We ask that you make us a blessing to ourselves, to each other, and to everyone we meet this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys. Amen. Have a great day. It's lovely outside. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. It was yeah. uh, always enlightening, really. Thank you. Yes. It was. Very good. Thank you, Tim. My pleasure. My pleasure. So y'all have a great day. I hope to see you guys Sunday. Yep. Good seeing everybody. Good